horror genre has historically struck fear into people's hearts. Whether it be the early days of depicting horror in cinema like what's portrayed in Nosferatu, or be it a more recent depiction like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there's little doubt that the horror genre can be a dark and scary place for its audience. When Team Silent debuted the survival horror game Silent Hill 20 years ago in 1999, they succeeded in both capturing the fear of its audience and delivering on a psychologically intense experience by emphasizing atmosphere more than anything that had come before it. That's not to say there weren't other good horror experiences at the time, but I think it's reasonable to say that Silent Hill made a name for itself in survival horror by integrating more abstract meaning into its story that could be interpreted differently based off of a few things. The specific ending a player encounters, the events that do or don't unfold during the player's gameplay experience, and the player's unique perspective on the events shown to them in-game. With this distinctive approach to the horror genre within the gaming industry, Silent Hill developed an identity of its own to take on that gamers couldn't find anywhere else. The original game clearly left a mark on gamers for years to come, spawning numerous follow-ups, spin-offs, and even movies, becoming a multi-million selling franchise and is one of Konami's most prolific IPs to date. This retrospective is a way to take a look back at the all-time survival horror classic that originally released 20 years ago, the game known as Silent Hill. Development on Silent Hill started as early as 1996, the same year that Capcom had released its survival horror classic, Resident Evil. Resident Evil's success resulted in studios inspired to develop similar games of their own. One of these many studios appeared to be Konami, more particularly their Tokyo subsidiary at the time that had just been created one year prior. In what appears to be a response to Resident Evil in retrospect, Konami had left a development group within this Tokyo subsidiary to handle their upcoming survival horror game. This development group was named Team Silent and may have comprised of staff that had failed at their previous projects, although the source to that information appears to have been lost, and because of this, it's difficult to confirm or deny the veracity of these claims. And even one of the developers of the original Silent Hill game, monster designer Masahiro Ito, stated that the overall paragraph in question was different from fact. In the early days of Silent Hill development, according to Akira Yamaoka, composer and in charge of general sound design for the game, the developers didn't know how to proceed with the Silent Hill project and might have been stuck in development for a period of time. <laughs> <laughs> Personnel and management of Konami lost faith in the game, but Team Silent may have gained artistic freedom in the process, and instead of making a more Hollywood-like atmosphere akin to Resident Evil, Team Silent favored an approach that would instead appeal to the player's emotions. Silent Hill's development was inspired by plenty of various horror media that likely helped to contribute to this direction. Some examples of this inspiration include the map and how many of the streets are named after numerous authors in the horror genre. With Finney Street referencing Jack Finney, Matheson is Richard Matheson, Robert Block, Ray Bradbury, Ira Levin, Richard Bachman, which is a pen name for Stephen King, and James Elroy. There are many more like this in the other maps of Silent Hill as well. Being inspired from other horror classics, such as with Jacob's Ladder, where a texture file in Silent Hill was found to be nearly identical to the one in the movie, it seems that Team Silent used many inspirations to help fuel their desire to create a truly unique and interesting survival horror experience with Silent Hill. One of the other ways Team Silent would go about appealing to the player's emotions was with the use of CGI cutscenes that would be praised by gaming publications and were all to be made by one talented individual who had to repeatedly appeal to Konami just to do so. 
first being required to do more basic tasks such as making subtitle letters and DUI for presentations to the older staff members. However, determined that he wanted more out of his work and noticing that his co-workers didn't have much knowledge working with 3D, this young man decided to compose his own four second chunk of a movie to present to his higher ups, saying, this is what I can do. Let me do some real 3D work, otherwise I won't teach anyone else. Which is what ultimately convinced his higher ups to let him handle more 3D work and resulted in him creating all of the CGI cutscenes for Silent Hill that we have today. Along with adding CGI cutscenes, there were other clever technical solutions that added to Silent Hill's unique atmosphere. While Resident Evil was largely made up of pre-rendered backgrounds, Silent Hill was instead constructed of fully 3D environments being rendered in real time. One issue that arose from this method of rendering, however, is that it's more taxing on the PlayStation 1's hardware and in order to achieve a reasonable level of performance, draw distance was low and a fog effect was put in place to mask its technical limitations. Whether or not it was also intended as an artistic choice, there's little doubt that this decision would have significant impact on the game's overall atmosphere, along with its subsequent sequels that also used a similar method for rendering in fog. All of these artistic and technical decisions would eventually finally be shown off to the public for the first time to watch at an E3 showing in the city of Atlanta, Georgia in May of 1998, not even a full year before its official release. To quickly note, this was the first E3 showing Silent Hill composer Akira Yamaoka would attend just to see the trailer he'd worked on as he mentioned it as an important memory of his. This was not only the first time the general public got a chance to watch a trailer of Silent Hill, but it would also feature its own gameplay demo at the Konami booth. You see fabulous lighting effect now. This works very well in the game to build tension. As you're exploring areas, you can't see beyond the range of your light. While some changes were made between the gameplay that was shown here and what was in the final release of the game, most differences were minor and the demo appeared to be largely representative of the overall final product. Silent Hill was once again shown a few months later at ECTS, the European Computer Trade Show in London, and fascinatingly enough, was said to only be about 40% complete for its showing. The third and final time that Silent Hill would be shown at a public event would be during the Tokyo Game Show Expo in the following October, not even four months before its official release. This too showed off a trailer, but it was largely similar to the one shown at E3 and didn't offer much new information about the game. The main difference being the song played, Silent Hill's main theme. A few months after the autumn showing of the Tokyo Game Show Expo, the US PlayStation Magazine released new details about Silent Hill in its January 1999 issue, including the control layout and a strategy guide for the demo disc which the aforementioned magazine also contained. Gamers finally had a chance to play the game before it officially released, even if only a couple weeks prior. This demo allowed the player to play two parts of what was in the full game one being Harry attempting to find his daughter at the beginning of the game, the other at the Midwich Elementary for some of the puzzles and monster offerings it had. Silent Hill would release for PlayStation in North America on January 31st, 1999, in Europe on February, and in Japan on the following March. Being a survival horror title released over one year after Capcom's critically well-received Resident Evil 2 and less than a year before the release of their upcoming title, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, Silent Hill could have released a generally poor reception by comparison due to how different its approach to the survival horror genre was. 
And while it didn't sell as well as Capcom's aforementioned survival horror classic, the game certainly left an impression on gamers that wouldn't go unnoticed. Silent Hill sold over 2 million copies worldwide and was well received by critics around the time of release. With almost nothing but 8s and beyond for its rating by major gaming publications such as PlayStation Magazine, IGN, and GameSpot, the game was instantly recognized as a genuinely good step in the right direction for Konami, and was also noteworthy as being a new IP for the company. While some criticisms were commonly stated about the game, mainly its similarities to Resident Evil, alongside controls and maneuverability frustration, Silent Hill was still largely praised for its disturbing and engrossing atmosphere that set players on edge. At the time, Silent Hill was a genre-defining endeavor, one that would influence other horror media of a similar style and a good amount of successors of its own. Contrasting with commonly known protagonists, Silent Hill follows an everyman whose name is Harry Mason and the story begins with him driving to the town of Silent Hill along with his daughter Cheryl in the passenger seat for vacation. A girl in the middle of the road appears and Harry swerves his car to avoid hitting her. Harry afterwards wakes up in the car and instead of going on vacation as originally planned, he must find his now missing daughter Cheryl. After searching through alleyways through thickening fog, the first attempt at finding his daughter quickly turns awry on his path, as everything quickly becomes darker and all of the monsters lurking in the dark come out to kill Harry, but only for him to actually awake in a nearby diner. Sybil Bennett, a cop who works in the nearby town of Brahms, asks Harry some questions, possibly suspicious of him committing a crime, before Harry asks her about his daughter Cheryl. The conversation is ultimately unproductive, however, since neither person has really seen anyone in Silent Hill outside of each other, and both could likely agree at this point that there's something bizarre going on in town. Harry nearly exits the diner to go find his daughter before Sybil's concern leads her to give him a firearm so he can protect himself. After finding a nearby radio that plays static near hostile creatures, the groundwork is now laid out for Harry to find Cheryl and this time with a weapon to help him on his journey. As he goes into the depths of Silent Hill to explore for his daughter, however, Harry finds that dangerous encounters with enemies have the potential to be quite scary and difficult if unprepared, though also somewhat sparse initially. But as both Harry and the player quickly discover, Silent Hill doesn't remain calm for very long. A desolate and mysterious rural town. Seemingly quiet, yet much of the unknown lies in the fog ahead. This is the setting that Silent Hill would use to great effect. Where other horror games and classics use scripted sequences and linear progression to force the player into unfortunate circumstances, Silent Hill drops the player into an already infested explorable world with little direction and demands them to seek out what's happening in the world anyway, as it's necessary to the main protagonist's ultimate goal. Silent Hill is a mysterious town with all sorts of oddities and strange occurrences, which happens to be true even if you're not keeping in mind of its dangerous creatures lurking seemingly everywhere. Within the town and throughout the game, Harry meets quite the varied cast of characters. Outside of an already introduced Cybel Bennett, other characters play intriguing roles throughout the game such as a group of inscrutable cultists seemingly up to no good. Michael Kaufman, director of Alcamilla Hospital who also deals a hallucinogenic drug known as PTV, and Lisa Garland, a nurse at the aforementioned hospital who appears to have severe amnesia. While these intriguing characters can certainly be off-putting, the town itself can be far more terrifying as it hosts all kinds of unknown beasts, literally or otherwise. Drowned in an unending fog, Silent Hill is almost solely crowded by tourists of an unsettling supernatural kind that occupy both its more open and wide areas of the town as well as the much more narrow buildings. Circumstances made even worse, the town periodically transforms itself into a nightmarish blood and metal infested landscape known as the Otherworld. What is this? What's going on here?
As the player progresses through the other world's most treacherous regions, Harry is forced to solve puzzles and either fight enemies or flee from them to make headway towards finding Cheryl. Chillingly, the other world in Silent Hill is often looked at as a symbolic manifestation of a person's psyche, meaning that someone in Silent Hill could have effectively created these circumstances due to their past or current mindset. Possibly scariest of all, however, is the ambiguity of the other world's existence itself, as it's still unsure whether the other world is a hallucination projected by the power of Silent Hill for their victims, whether the characters themselves are transported to a parallel world, or the town is possibly even a sort of dream world. What is known is that Silent Hill is rarely anything but a dark and scary place for its visitors. CGI cutscenes contributed heavily to help create this unsettling atmosphere and provide a reasonable story mechanism for Silent Hill, but it wasn't easy to pull off. The cutscenes in question required talent to pull off, and it seemed that only one man was fit for the job. It was 1996, and Konami was on the hunt for talent at the Tama Art University of Tokyo in Japan, likely looking for people who could work on 3D which was still new and emerging within the gaming industry. Although working for a game company wasn't a very popular choice for fine art students of the time, one man who replied to Konami's contact form would go on to do amazing work within the company. Uh, um, you know, muscles, you know, in here, it's tightened. But a uh, motion capture cannot cannot capture it. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, if I, I make them in front of a mirror, I can notice it. I can capture it. You know, that's most of uh, you know, the biggest reason. After at least three art tests and five interviews, a man named Takeyoshi Sato, who received a BFA in oil painting at the aforementioned university, would become discouraged from applying to any other company and went to work for Konami, first creating animations for the PS1 and Sega Saturn ports of the game titled Sexy Parodius, but afterwards being able to work on the first Silent Hill title. Plenty of challenges were on its way, however, both technical and within the company. Sato had many troubles creating the characters, particularly skull shapes and attempting to create authentic Caucasian models since he didn't have any reference. While technical challenges were prevalent, there was also uncertainty about who would be credited for what work within Team Silent. According to Sato, who created all of the CG in the game, older people get more respect within companies in Japanese society and thus, he didn't receive credit for his earlier demos and presentations that were also made in 3D. In an interview with Gamasutra about how the 3D work would play out, he also mentioned that his boss wanted to find someone above him to give direction. And quote, because in Japanese companies, they don't want to credit someone like me, who's the youngest in the team. He wanted to give me a CGI and visual supervisor, but that was kind of strange because I had all of the pipeline, and 30 or 40% of all movie sequences done. Why should I have a supervisor for that? So I said, I don't need anybody above me, and a fight started, during which my boss said, Fine then, can you finish everything on your own? And I had to say, okay, I will. That's why I had to do everything, and do everything he did, although not many people would believe him. And when another developer of Silent Hill, Keiichiro Toyama, was asked if this was true that all the pre-rendered cutscenes were created by one person, he replied, yes, Sato is the man. Takeyoshi Sato mentioned, I just had to do it in order to get credit. Plus, you don't want to be credited in your game as an assistant artist if you did everything. This entire workload wasn't easy for Sato, however, as he claims that he didn't go home for almost three years, effectively living in his office because he had to access all of over 150 computers to render his cutscenes, which took an approximate total of 2,000 hours in just render time over the span of two and a half real years. With the praise the game received and the atmosphere these cutscenes would help contribute to, however, I think many people would find that these efforts and struggles were ultimately worth it in the end.
developed in a nightmare world of narrow hallways, classrooms likely reminiscent of innocent childhood, and a place where killing childlike creatures is essential to survive. This is Midwich Elementary School. Being led to the school by Cheryl via scrawls from her sketchbook, this would be the first major building in Silent Hill that Harry Mason explores and would also be the first content-filled area of the game with its own enemies to fight off and assortment of puzzles to solve. While the enemies are destructive enough to kill Harry if the player's not vigilant, puzzles are ultimately innocuous, albeit a little unsettling. Harry primarily encounters one enemy type in this version of the elementary school. Mumblers, although the US version of the enemy would later be called Grey Children in strategy guides. These American versions were rejected elsewhere for resembling real life children too much as well as being able to kill said creatures. Other childlike creatures that weren't censored in the game can also be found in Midwich Elementary School, likely left in because you can do them no harm. These are larval stalkers. Appearing to be the size of a toddler and translucent like ghosts, these mysterious creatures are friendly and only walk around making squeaking noises before disappearing. Puzzles also have its own unsettling feel to them and require burning a hand with a corrosive chemical to acquire a gold medallion with a picture of a clock tower engraved on the surface, and playing a bloodied piano according to the cryptic directions of a nearby poem, which in turn allows Harry to acquire another medallion, although this time silver but also with a picture of a clock tower engraved on the surface. Harry must place these medallions in the clock tower that lies in the courtyard in order to progress. Finally, after unlocking the clock tower doors by starting a boiler, Harry is then able to enter the clock tower to traverse the other world version of the school. Where am I? Have I been here before? Covered in blood and rust, and unlike previously being game over if Harry dies, this is the first time the other world would truly make a long lasting and prominent impact on the player. As Harry makes his way to the basement boiler room, there are even more puzzles and enemies to face than ever before. Solving puzzles requires many different items and keys to unlock areas that, while explored in the normal world, are no longer able to be explored in the other world normally. Encountering more difficult enemies of different types along the way, the player can find at least a little solace in being able to find a shotgun on the first floor. After Harry finds all the necessary items, solves the appropriate puzzles, and successfully fends off or flees from the onslaught of deadly enemies, he can enter the final otherworld inflicted room of the school, the boiler room. If the player had previously taken any relief in thinking there wouldn't be any boss battles due to playing a horror game and not a traditional action game, the player would be regretfully mistaken. A much more powerful monstrosity and also first boss of the game is introduced in the boiler room, going by the name of Splithead. If Harry does successfully manage to defeat this unnerving creature, however, Harry hears a loud siren and Silent Hill transitions back to its normal fog-filled state, and with bells ringing in the distance, Harry now has a new and clear objective to follow. Midwich Elementary School would be just the first of a few main areas to explore, solve puzzles, and combat enemies in both the main world and the other world. Starting by depicting childlike creatures right off the bat is quite the risky venture for the game since this was rarely, if ever, portrayed in such a horrific way before. Combine that with the oppressive atmosphere and sense of dread this game would force upon the player in the first genuinely dangerous other world of the series, Midwich Elementary School would give quite the first harrowing showing this franchise has to offer. With Silent Hill's atmosphere comes pushing the technical boundaries of what was possible with the PlayStation's rendering. Capcom and other developers of survival horror would use technology that was typically sensible for the effect they were attempting to create, but Team Silent had achieved technological results that were much more impressive than most other horror games of its era, and were also uniquely appropriate to the style Silent Hill had gone for, an impressive showing for the overall team's first game. 
one part in showcasing its technical design, the gameplay for Silent Hill was much slower than the other games it would inevitably be compared against. For instance, Resident Evil includes a combat knife, regular handgun, shotgun, magnum, machine gun for the PC port, grenade launcher, and flamethrower for its assortment of weaponry. While Silent Hill does include some of these same weapons, and a couple that are comedically powerful only after beating the game under particular conditions, most weapons, which Harry can use somewhat clumsily, are typical of what you would find in a rural town and tame in comparison to the likes of other horror games for the time. Nevertheless, this likely wasn't due to a lack of good design choices, but was instead a complement to the character design of the game's main protagonist, who is just an everyman trying to find his daughter. With many other games attempting to make you, the player, feel like a hero when going into combat by having an arsenal of effective weaponry for the opponents you face, Silent Hill instead makes the player feel more like a regular person attempting to combat swaths of terrifying enemies in a seemingly endless nightmare of horrors with only a few weapons and the ammo you can accumulate to help. And gamers loved it. Although attempting to give a genuine sense of dread and misfortune to the player, Silent Hill isn't so unforgiving that it's unfair. With an easy mode, plenty of ammo even outside this low difficulty, and melee combat that can be effective if cautious, Silent Hill still treats the player with enough respect so they're always given enough options to succeed. Silent Hill's weapons are reasonably balanced for the average player, being effective enough to be able to progress throughout the game while not being so effective that you can throw caution into the wind without consequence, thereby ruining the dreadful atmosphere the game has worked so hard to achieve. Add on to that, the fact you can attempt to flee from enemies, while keeping in mind the need to backtrack at times, you come across genuine choices the player has to make instead of a clearly linear answer to every combat encounter. After escaping the horrors held at Midwich Elementary School and following ringing bells in the distance, Harry Mason for the first time meets a strange woman by the name of Dahlia Gillespie at a nearby church, the Balkan Church. Spouting what is mostly seemingly incoherent babble, Dahlia does mention of a girl, possibly Cheryl, tells Harry to go to Alcamillo Hospital and leaves Harry with a couple of objects. One being a drawbridge key he'll need to reach the other side of the town where the hospital is, the other a mysterious pyramid-shaped object called Floros. With no good alternatives for Harry, he makes his way to Alcamillo Hospital. Deceptively appearing to be a calm and safe place at first, and seemingly absent of life, these hallways end up containing nurses and doctors, but instead of providing care for the road to recovery, the medical physicians who reside here are creatures of terror affected by a parasite and only intend to inflict pain on their visitors. This is Alcamilla Hospital. After arriving at the hospital, Harry first hears a gunshot and is thus enticed to see what's going on. Here we find and speak to Dr. Kaufman, stating that he only works at the hospital, although he is actually the director of the medical staff. Dr. Kaufman appears just as bewildered as Harry about the recent events taking place at Silent Hill and, uneasy about his current circumstances, decides to go elsewhere, leaving Harry alone yet again. Exploring the hospital, Harry discovers three floors and a basement with little else to find. After getting back on the elevator, however, Harry notices there's now a fourth floor option, one that's not on the map and was previously inaccessible. Left without options, Harry rides the elevator to this unknown floor and thereby shifts yet again to the other world. The number four is unlucky in traditional Japanese superstition due to its pronunciation, sometimes being she, which is the word for death. In this case, the fourth floor acts as an intermediary for the calm version of the hospital and its otherworldly counterpart. 
now infested with parasitic physicians and yet again blood and rusted filled interiors, Harry fights more enemies and solves more puzzles on various floors of the hospital until he finds a friendly nurse who's crouched under a table terrified. Lisa Garland, appearing to have a similar experience to Dr. Kaufman, explains that she was passed out and everyone seemed to be gone when she awoke. Harry, still unable to get any answers about his daughter Cheryl, is instead informed that no one goes to the basement due to very strict orders and before the conversation can continue any further, a siren blares and Harry is transported back to the fog infested Silent Hill with a massive headache showing that Silent Hill does contain multiple, seemingly normal people in it through the dangerous travels of Alcamilla Hospital gives a bizarre look on Silent Hill and what kind of place this town really is. Are these people truly just regular people like Harry? Are they a manifestation of something greater? And what sorts of paths would open if Harry further developed relationships with these people in such a desolate and horrible place? The other world also provides all sorts of questions regarding the monsters it appears to conjure, and while a few answers would be given, one fact persists so far. The dangers appear to be as real as ever and Harry desperately needs to find his daughter who is also in the terrifying town of Silent Hill. horror has a few definitions attributed to it. I think most fans of the horror genre would agree to one of them as a primary definition, specified by Cambridge Dictionary as being a strong feeling of fear, shock, or disgust, or an event that produces such a feeling. Yet these may not be the predominant emotions Silent Hill is necessarily meant to evoke, and many members of Team Silent would likely agree. While certainly consisting of those traditional horror elements of course, Silent Hill is also meant to have a different, engaging take on the survival horror genre, one that immerses the player more fully even with its frights and horrors that await. For the music of Silent Hill, Akira Yamaoka shares his experiences in the creation process stating that while Silent Hill is a horror game and he does want people to be scared, he simultaneously thinks about a message that he wants to convey to players, and while there are more traditional combat scene styles of music, Akira instead opts to think about what the character is thinking, and what made him get into a fight in the first place. Instead of using more common orchestral instruments, Akira decides to use other instruments often for dramatic purposes and instead of using more intense music during surprises or attacks, he frequently decides to create sudden silences and very soft music so that sounds stay unpredictable for the player to anticipate. Reflecting upon the music, another member of Team Silent also mentioned the music as being noteworthy, stating that it's not like a Hollywood movie style orchestra but is instead closer to noise than anything else, matching the hysteric mood that, when combined with the game's graphics, creates a total horror experience. The CGI director Takeo Ishisato also appears to support this to some extent by stating his desires to make the town of Silent Hill touch players on a deeper level. Being depicted as desolated, filled with sorrow, and yet, is still somehow difficult to stop loving. Takeo Ishii also discussed his interests that lie more in profound artwork that remains in people's hearts for a long time with more serious tones that allow the developers to convey deep storytelling instead of making quick money that only provide an experience that's primarily about killing monsters. As a final, roundabout way of driving the point home, let's take a look at the director, writer, and background designer of the game for a second, Keiichiro Toyama, who claims to have been quite the scaredy cat who never really enjoyed the more typical aspects of bloody, shocking horror and didn't even really think of Silent Hill as that much of a horror game. He was surprised when people told him it was scary after its launch and in his eyes, the scariest part of the game was the fear that naturally grows within you, not the typical frightening creatures or jump scares and the like. 
After meeting Lisa Garland in the other world, Dahlia Gillespie once again appears before Harry, tells him that the town of Silent Hill is being devoured by darkness, and mentions that a mark, known as the Mark of Samael, must not be completed. Still hungry for answers and a lead to find Cheryl, however, the determined Harry picks up the antique shop key left inside the room and goes toward the only direction he's once again been given. Harry runs into Cybele a second time, now at the antique shop, and she claims to have seen a girl out on the lake. Harry further explores the antique shop and finds an altar, whose origin is unknown. He somehow suddenly seemingly transitions to the other world and finds himself back at the hospital with Lisa in front of him, who states that Harry was just having a bad dream and directs him to the lake in town. After transitioning between the regular fog-filled Silent Hill and the other world, fighting more deadly creatures through the sewers and the town's resort area, Harry eventually enters a boat and finds Cybele once again. Harry reflects on Dahlia Gillespie's words at the hospital and determines that the town of Silent Hill is being engulfed by the other world. Dahlia yet again finds Harry and convinces him to traverse to the lighthouse to stop a demon and save Cheryl. Fruitless, however, Harry only sees the mark of Samael and a girl by the name of Alessa at the top of the lighthouse before deciding to find Sybil at the Lakeside Amusement Park. Alessa and Dahlia soon arrive, with Alessa being revealed as Dahlia's daughter. With Harry going in and out of the other world, almost seamlessly at this point, and constantly being engaged with creatures of a supernatural sort either way, the lines between reality and the imaginary become blurred. The game doesn't give a clear answer, but still encourages the player to find out more about the town of Silent Hill and its supernatural tendencies using Dahlia Gillespie, who appears to know a lot about the things going on in Silent Hill. But even without a clear answer of where to go or what to do after clearing out an area that Harry's led to, Dahlia always seems to be there, giving Harry direction. Creepy and unsettling, it's as if Dahlia stalks Harry and is controlling his actions for a specific unknown purpose, and the events that unfold next are quite possibly just as creepy and unsettling as they've ever been. After a brief flash of light, Harry finds himself in a distorted world but in a place resembling the hospital, known only as Nowhere. He finds Lisa yet again, though this will be the last occasion until the end of the game. Save me from them. Please. Harry? While there are theories and ideas that make an attempt at explaining precisely why this sequence plays out as it does, many players are amazed by the emotional impact this scene had with its visuals and music alone to comprise a wholesome and darkly artistic expression that hadn't been seen before in gaming, and without the need for more explanation. After more puzzle solving, Harry finds Dahlia for the last time and receives an explanation of many events taking place. Dahlia sacrificed her daughter to fire seven years prior to bring about the birth of a god worshipped by their cult, the Order, and that god resided within Alessa. Alessa split her soul in half to prevent it from being born, where the first half is Alessa and the latter being Cheryl, who Harry and his wife found on the road. At the beginning of the game, Alessa called Cheryl back to Silent Hill so that her full power would be restored and made several seals of Metatrine on Silent Hill, which Dahlia called the Mark of Samael, to destroy the town from the world, thereby preventing the birth of the aforementioned god. Dahlia used Harry with the Floros given to him to bring the two halves of her soul back together, and the god creature now manifests itself. 
Harry faces this creature which kills Dahlia instantly, and being the final boss battle of the game, Harry eventually defeats it, revealing the ending based on the player's previous choices. With the success of the first Silent Hill game alongside groundbreaking concepts in the survival horror genre, one would expect a multitude of successors, both inspired by the original game by different companies, as well as numerous sequels by the original development team, Team Silent, to satisfy this new cult following the game had accrued. While these expectations would be met to a certain extent with numerous sequels, movies, collections, even an adaptation of the original game to the Game Boy Advance, and games made that are inspired by Silent Hill, the fate of Team Silent and Silent Hill would fundamentally turn bitter. Silent Hill 2, 3, and 4 would release in 2001, 2003, and 2004 respectively. Silent Hill 2 and 3 were lauded, possibly even more so than the original game that allowed their development to be possible in the first place, and are often looked at to this day as being some of the best horror games of all time. While Silent Hill 4 The Room would end up with a more mixed reception upon release, it still garnered its own praise and approval by many fans despite its drastic gameplay changes which helped split the fan base. After the lukewarm reception of this fourth main entry in the franchise, however, Silent Hill would never be the same again, and outside of composer Akira Yamaoka, the series would largely be developed by staff unassociated with Team Silent since their disbandment in 2005. Following this unfortunate departure were games and movies that, for the most part, also felt like a departure of Silent Hill as a whole to many fans, and it showed in ratings and reviews. Where the first Silent Hill games and movie helped pull in attention and positive reception from the survival horror fanbase, the latter ones would seemingly deliver the franchise to its end. But guess what? I will be coming back, and I'm bringing my new toys with me. After nearly two years of dead silence within the franchise, there would be but a single glimmer of hope when, in the August of 2014, it would be announced that Hideo Kojima, who worked heavily on the Metal Gear franchise, filmmaker Guillermo del Toro, and actor Norman Reedus would collaborate to create a new title in the franchise, Silent Hills. A terrifying demo titled PT would release for free around this time to give players all over the world a taste of possible future offerings the series could still give, and fans were hyped to see what Silent Hills would have in store. Dismally, however, a lengthy and profound conflict between Kojima and Konami would escalate and result in Silent Hills cancellation in spring of the following year. Alongside the cancellation of Silent Hills, Konami stated itself to be committed to new titles in the franchise. Potentially disrespectful to its core fanbase, however, intentionally or otherwise, the only things to have come from the franchise since is a Silent Hill pachinko machine that made its appearance in Japan on 2015, and a trademark claim on April of 2018 that may indicate a second one on its way. The original Silent Hill game created an extraordinary and unique atmosphere for the time, and the sequels that followed it evolved rapidly. While many fans would be turned off by the Western Company's attempts at a Silent Hill game, most of even those games offered their own unique spin on the survival horror genre. Some of these titles even collected their own unique praise that hadn't been achieved by the main Team Silent Made franchise. Silent Hill will likely never consist of the same innovation that made the original so captivating, but as the glimpse that PT had shown, that doesn't mean Silent Hill couldn't be rebirthed with new innovation and a new formula to reinvigorate the horror genre to hold up to a new, potentially even better standard. While possibly difficult to find, there may be great developers just waiting to be found. 
Whether or not Konami is willing to spend the time, effort, or resources on finding new developers, however, is unfortunately unlikely. Damage done to the flesh, what they said.